Good morning. The government said to you in their opening statement that they had no choice but to call convicted felons as witnesses. That's what their case is about. That's what their case is based on. You have heard testimony on the stand from people who have lied all of their life, committed crimes all of their life, deceived friends, relatives, all of their life. But the thing is, you are the ones who have a choice. You have a choice of whether or not to believe them. This case against Walter Porter is built on nothing more than a pack of lies. When you don't believe, when you can't believe these snitches, it's like a house of cards. Everything falls. What you have heard over the past two and a half, almost three weeks, is about a culture. A culture. A subculture in New Orleans, the 13th Ward and on Josephine Street. There are people that are just surviving. I think they come from backgrounds that are different than every one of us. I'm going to go through these witnesses, but I want to talk in general terms about this culture of lying, of surviving, of drugs, of getting out of jail and doing whatever you need to do for yourself regardless of what happens to others, to friends, to spouses, to girlfriends, boyfriends. The thing is, the government, the FBI, the U.S. Attorney's Office has tried to break into that culture and tried to find the truth, but the truth is not there. These people are absolutely incapable of telling the truth. When you have lived your entire life and all you have learned or know is survival, and to do and say whatever it takes just to get up in the morning, you don't suddenly change because you have taken the stand, you have taken an oath, you have signed an agreement that there may be a threat of perjury. I doubt any of you are convinced that because they may be charged with perjury, they are suddenly going to tell the truth. So they may have a choice of whether or not to tell the truth, but you know if you have never learned how to tell the truth, you don't suddenly wake up after a life of lies and committing crimes to tell the truth. That's just not going to happen. There are choices. People can choose whether or not to commit a crime. One of the things we can't choose is whether or not we are going to be accused of a crime. While Walter Porter lived in the 13th Ward, he had no choice that these people were going to lie and were going to accuse him of a crime. We are going to talk about multiple witnesses that testified against Walter Porter. I'm even going to talk about Danielle Hampton because I think she gives you an idea or a kind of window into the culture of lying even though she didn't have anything to do with Walter. I think we have to take all of this and recognize this case has been a high profile case for many, many years. These murders have been in the media, not just 10, 20 times, but hundreds of times on NOLA.com and in The Advocate. They have been on television. This information is not that difficult to find out. It's not difficult for these snitches to be able to repeat what they've read in the media or to repeat what they have heard amongst themselves. I think that if anything, you have gotten a window into the culture in the jail and out of jail and on the streets that people were talking about this and rumors were created. Somewhere along the line, I had heard that if you say something three times, it becomes the truth. That's what happened in the 13th Ward when people started talking about Walter Porter and suddenly he became the Telly Hankton hitman. I think if we go down, we analyze and think through each one of these snitches, we come back to nothing but a pack of lies. I don't think any of you would be fooled that magically they would suddenly decide to tell the truth just because they had an agreement. There are some things, some subtle hints that I want to talk about generally. You will notice that Fettison, Aaron Smith, Charisse, the letters that they wrote, particularly Fettison and Aaron Smith. The older letters started talking about Dear Mrs. Privatera, but if you notice, later on they became Liz. There became a familiarity, a way in which they now communicate with each other that becomes kind of cozy. Now they refer to her as Liz, as she is directing them, Fetty, Aaron. But make no mistake about it, their testimony, any way you want to look at it, was bought and paid for. The currency was their testimony for their freedom. We only called one witness. I will talk about him a little later. But we had no such currency to trade in, other than the power of the court to subpoena a witness to come in. Now one of the things that, this is a group, is that their stories are alike. That's bound to happen after a number of years of the prosecution, the FBI bringing them in, talking to them. Well, did Walter Porter brag a lot? Did he talk about shooting a lot? A lot of times? Did Walter Porter talk about carrying two guns and shooting with two guns? So after a while, you know what to say. You know what they want. Somewhere along the line, when the judge instructs you on how to determine credibility, even without his instructions, you know that motivation is a key factor in determining whether or not someone is lying or telling the truth. In each one of these witnesses, their motivation was clear. 
One of the general factors to look at is they spent a lot of time with graphs and ballistics. They talk about all these guns that Walter had, but he was not caught with any of the guns connected to the murders. That is an important fact. So let's begin by talking about Sharice Gibson and Gerard Howard. Sharice talks to Nathan Gibson on a phone call, and she says she knows who they want. They need him. They need Telly. They need Mooney. From the very beginning, it's pretty clear where they are going. They know what they need to do, and they know what they want them to do. The FBI told them who to blame. That man told me today. Man basically said Mooney ain't coming home. He's not. When her brother Nathaniel said he wishes he had something concrete, Sharice tells him, yeah, I'm working on it. Now she knows from a very early period of time what to do, how to do, how the system works. You heard Mrs. Sneed talk about Rule 35. You all know about it. They know about it. But also look at the character of this person. She has lied in court, perjured herself before another jury, and her husband was found not guilty. These people know how to play the game. What's also important is that she was never prosecuted for perjury. Now, Gerard Howard, he has already killed two people. He was charged with second degree, pled guilty to a manslaughter. People come to Gerard Howard with hits. Is this the type of person you're going to trust? You're going to rely on to convict somebody? To send somebody to jail for the rest of their life? He is a heroin addict. If any of you have anything to deal with drug addictions or alcohol, they cannot be trusted. Michael Anderson, you saw Mike. He didn't even know Walter Porter. He is serving a life sentence and an 80-year federal sentence. And he tells you he hears about this on the street. Everybody knows about this. He never hung with Walter Porter before, but somehow Walter Porter is just going to come up and trust him and confess to him? It makes no sense. But Mike Anderson, he knows how the game is played. He comes in and he testifies. He said that there was a third person on the docks. Well, they talk about cooperation when they talk to the witnesses. They wanted to cooperate them. Well, where's the cooperation with Mr. Anderson? Where's the third person on the docks? Where are the records that they were on the docks? They have records for everything. Where are those records? Gerard Fettison, also known as Fetty. He was the guy who sat back in the chair. Mr. Cocky, admitted to reducing his sentence. Well, he is the one that Miss Sneed was talking about, that wrote a letter to his attorney about getting a fake transcript. His letter was very interesting talking about how to lie to his wife or his girlfriend. But do you believe a guy who is working to reduce his sentence and he tells us that he is here to save the public? That's insulting, ladies and gentlemen. He is here for one reason and one reason only, and that's to reduce his sentence. This is the same guy who forced, the same man that forced Damon Pollard to sign two affidavits. Fettison was arrested with multiple guns, and he claims that Walter Porter was nearby. This is one of the government's counts against Walter. But where is Damon Pollard? Why isn't he here? Fettison claims that Walter Porter ran because they saw the police officer. But we don't even have the police officer. We have no evidence that Walter was there. Cece, Celestine Esquia, the other witnesses testified that you can't trust the word she says, but the government is asking you to trust her. Esquia has cooperated for a long time. She's avoided the armed robbery conviction. She admitted to driving the trail car in the armed robbery. I've got this note that she sleeps with an assault rifle. I just thought that was bizarre. And looking at that, I've never seen a firearm like that before. She also threatened Deborah Muhammad over a commissary, threatened to charge Kevin Jackson. Haley Smith, one right after the other. He testified he was at Walter Porter's almost every day for three years. But Celestine Esquia, she said he was only there a few times. Who do you believe, ladies and gentlemen? They contradict each other. Then he claims that Walter Porter, Miss Need had to mention this. She had claimed that Walter Porter had ran up the stairs to shoot John Matthews, but we all saw the pictures of John Matthews. I asked Mr. Matthews about the stairs, and there were no stairs in the house. Joe Miller, this was a man who wasn't called by the prosecutor, but he has avoided the death penalty. He was supposed to be called. He hasn't been sentenced yet. He claims that only he and Walter Porter were there for the shooting of John Matthews. But John Matthews said he only saw one person. He believed that there were two, but he clearly identified Thomas Hankton as the shooter. This is not a person we can believe. Aaron Smith, this guy has been through the system for a long time. He has been cooperating for a long time. He has avoided the death penalty. He writes to Ms. Privatera that he wants to be home in July, in the next couple of weeks. He is testifying to get off of a life sentence and be home next week. 
Is this a person that you can trust? That you could possibly find Walter Porter guilty beyond a reasonable doubt? Can you believe him beyond a reasonable doubt? Then the bizarre story about going to Walter Porter, meaning Walter Porter. Walter Porter wanted to kill Reed, hadn't even met. There isn't any evidence at this time that Walter had even met Telly Hankton. But then there's the really bizarre story about his plan to become friends with Jesse Reed so he could help out his cousin to kill Jesse Reed. How is that a person you could possibly trust? He has the gumption to try to become friends with someone? You know he is lying. You know he is lying to Jesse Reed to kill him. Well, if he is willing to lie to somebody to get them killed, he is certainly going to lie to you. He said he did this for family affection. If he is going to do it just for family affection, he is clearly going to lie to you so that he can get out before his birthday. He talked about Dewing or Wayne Alvarez, but where is he? He had hid Dewing's involvement from the FBI. In the government's opening statement, they said that Dewing or Wayne was going to testify, but Agent Burris was unable to find his phone number. I have here a note about him being dark-skinned like Jesse Reed's killer, much darker than Walter. Maybe he was the one that was with Telly Hankton or with the other two people in the car that shot. Don't know, but that's not our burden. We know both Aaron Smith and DeWing had houses full of guns, but we haven't seen any of these guns. We also know that DeWing and Aaron had access to Walter's house. Some of those guns could have been Aaron Smith's. Let's talk about Danielle Hampton. What I found interesting about Danielle Hampton is that she never could explain to you why she lied for Telly Hankton. She came up with all kinds of excuses about she had made a commitment, but she never answered the question why she did it. The reason I find that very interesting is because I think that she gives us this additional perspective into the culture of lying. Here's a woman who had a pretty decent job, but even she is incapable of really telling the truth. She is capable of walking into a courtroom and lying to help out a friend. In my family, and I'm sure in yours, trust in telling the truth is everything. I never lied to my mother, my father. But these people, these people that you have heard from, Danielle Hampton, they just never got that. They just never learned. It's not part of it. The government is asking you to put Walter Porter away for the rest of his life based on these people who can't tell the truth. So Walter Porter, the hitman, does this really make sense? He is a hitman who can't get somebody to sign a piece of paper? You have heard Cornell Evans. He was supposed to seen a piece of paper saying that he had a gun for Fettison. He said Walter Porter approached him. He said no. Okay, end of story. I don't know. I picture a hitman being a lot more intimidating, threatening, cajoling. But a no is good enough? That doesn't sound like a hitman. A hitman who doesn't know what the target looked like? Gerard Fettison said that Walter Porter went looking for Jesse Reed without knowing what he looked like, rode around. Makes no sense. The hitman went to kill somebody without any contract? Aaron Smith said that Walter Porter went to kill Jesse Reed before making contact with Telly Hankton. Does that make sense? Then the big question. Walter Porter supposedly confessed to all these people. We are counting eight. To multiple crimes and appear in a rap video. I'm going to talk about the rap video a little bit more later. Gerard Fettison said Walter Porter told Emmanuel Holmes that he killed his cousin. Is he going to admit to a cousin? Just doesn't make sense. So one of the opportunities the government had, and they talk about cooperating, but what I'm seeing as their cooperation is getting these eight people to tell the same story. As I mentioned earlier with Mr. Anderson, they could have cooperated, they were at least at the docks at the same time. One of the pieces of evidence I thought, if I was them, what I would do to cooperate the story of Sharice Gibson, Howard, and Cece was the payment to the lawyer. Here's an opportunity to have somebody outside of this culture that could come in and say, yeah, I got $9,000 or $10,000 from CC to represent Walter. What about a copy of the receipt? Where's the lawyer? Why don't we have the lawyer? Why didn't the lawyer come in? So I'm going to talk about the murder shortly. But before I transition to that, there's lots of missing evidence you would see in an individual murder case that you don't see in a RICO case, where they just throw all the mud against the wall and hope something sticks and you think he is a bad person and you convict him. There are no fingerprints. There are no footprints. There's no DNA. There's no confession. There's no video or audio recording other than the video outside of the jazz daiquiri. This case has a lot of jailhouse recordings, but not a single one of them were of Walter Porter, who likes to boast, according to their testimony. But there isn't a single recording of Walter Porter admitting that he killed anybody or even a discussion about any of the murders. Let's talk about the three guns that were recovered. We have the one from Bobby Beskine, a 9mm. 
Bobby Beskin was arrested with a 9mm Glock when chasing assailants in a car. He was using the gun. When he was arrested, he tested positive for gunshot residue. But Baskin later told the federal jury that he never fired the weapon. We have it directly from the transcript. Okay, did you ever fire the weapon? No. There were at least two lineups. Baskin did not identify Walter Porter in the first lineup, which was lost. And then Baskin told the federal jury he did not see the person who sold him the gun in the lineup. You know, a lineup of six photographs on it, right? And you look at it. And did you see the person who sold you that gun? No. After Baskin testified that he couldn't identify the person who sold him the gun in the lineup, Agent Burris took Baskin out of the grand jury room where he showed him another lineup, which contained, actually, it says lineup. I'm not sure if it was a lineup or if it was a book of pictures containing women and men that look nothing like Walter, but this is after he has seen two lineups. It's suggestive, ladies and gentlemen. This is a man who has got... You know that when he was arrested, at some point these officers must have said to him, this is a gun that was used to kill people. Did you do it? Tell us. I'm sure that there was an extensive interrogation. The question is, did Bobby Biskeen buy this gun from Walter Porter? Well, he told Burris and O'Hearn that he bought it on... But Peter Warren, who he brought in, said that he had bought a gun on... But it was a 9mm Smith & Wesson, and that the gun he bought had been stolen. This is a guy who has nothing to gain from his testimony. We got him here under a subpoena without any promises, reward, nothing to do with any sentences, or we don't have any of that power. And it also would be illegal if we paid him any money or gave him anything. The 9mm was used in murders that didn't come from Walter. It came from someone else. So the question is, who is Bobby Biskeen protecting? He may be protecting himself. Is it Joe Miller? Is it DeWing? Don't know. The second gun comes from a confidential informant. Well, how did the confidential informant get the gun? Where did it come from? Sharice Howard testified that she turned in a gun. Is that the same gun? 11 months earlier, she said that she and her brother had nothing concrete, but she was working on it. Is this what she was working on? Don't know. Why was the gun recovered in December of 2012? The third gun was the Taurus 9mm. Who was this gun recovered from? Don't you want to know? Why is that person not a witness in this case? What's the connection with Walter? Who was the gun? Before I talk about Jesse Tutu, I want to talk about the video, the guilty by association. Now the government can't come in here and say to you Walter is guilty by association with all of these people, but they are trying to do it through a video. The judge will instruct you, as you have heard a number of times, that your duty is to look at the evidence and hold the government's burden to proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Guilty by association, we can associate with anyone that doesn't make us guilty of anything. This video, the BG video by the same title, I'm sure the lyrics were written at one time, the recording of the lyrics was done at another time, and the recording outside on Liberty Street was done at a third time. It was synced together by an editor. It is nothing more than art. Rap artists talk about violence and murders all the time. That doesn't make them a murderer. Very briefly, before I get to the murders, the FBI and their investigation what they have done is they keep going back to the same sources. They have eight of these people telling you basically the same story. As the judge will instruct you, it doesn't matter how many witnesses there are. It's the quality. It's the weight of the evidence. It's whether or not they have proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt. Having convicted felons tell you the same story over and over again doesn't change anything. Does it make? It may make their case seem stronger, but when you are deliberating, it is not any stronger. It's the same thing. It's the rumor that you hear more than three times that suddenly people think it's the truth. But your duty is to think this thing through. Think through Baskin's connection to the gun, Aaron Smith's connection to Telly Hankton. There's a thing I learned very long ago. In forensic sciences, they call it confirmation bias. That's when you believe something and you just keep going back confirming what you already believe. That's what the FBI did. They believed that Telly Hankton, Walter Porter, were guilty of these crimes, and all they did was blindly, with tunnel vision, focus on that. The Jesse Tutu Reed murder on June 20th, 2009. Walter Porter was not at the scene, and he doesn't match the description of the perpetrator. I want to go through. We've got the statement that Jesse Reed was shot at about 11.56. We got Walter Porter was not at the crime scene from 11.21 until 11.56. I want you to go through there, not have a confirmation bias, don't take their story, but
but analyze the evidence yourself. The cell tower places Walter Porter actually away from the crime scene. All of the cell tower sectors used by Walter Porter from 1121 until 1156 face away from the crime scene. So we have kind of looked at it from a different perspective than what they are telling you, the story they have been telling you. Take a look for yourself. When you go back into deliberate, take a look at this piece of evidence for yourself. Now, as you have heard by Miss Sneed, and I'm not trying to repeat what she said, but sometimes I have to, there were false identifications. I think what this does is it gives you an invitation to think about how people are falsely accused and arrested and convicted of crimes. You heard about Calloway and Reed, but now you are hearing information from people who have their own self-interest. I only mention that because there are parallels that can be made between Donald Reed and Calloway that you have heard from Aaron Smith, Sharice Howard, and the others. Now we are talking about Mr. Williams' statement. He very clearly stated that the person was dark-skinned for sure, not Walter Porter. He said that Telly Hankton was in the front seat. There was a front seat passenger who was dark-skinned. He told this to the police, and he also told this to the grand jury. It doesn't fit the description of Walter Porter. It's nothing like Walter Porter. On July 4th, a couple of weeks later, there's the Hassan Williams murder. You heard a Crime Stoppers tip. Troy Hankton killed Hassan Williams. As I'm going through this, I'm going to try not to repeat, but really the only proof of the Jesse Reed murder, the Hassan Williams murder, is the snitch testimony. That's really it. So in the Hassan Williams murder, there's a Crime Stoppers tip that Troy Hankton killed Hassan Williams. The officer also testified there were fingerprints from the electrical box. Well, it would have been nice to cooperate or to get or to analyze the fingerprints. That may have exonerated Walter Porter if that had been done. John Matthews is shooting now. All of our hearts go out to Mr. Matthews for his loss and his sacrifice. He is clearly an honest man, which we can't say about the snitches. But he identified Thomas Hankton, and he did not identify Walter Porter. He carefully said he believed there were two people, but he didn't know. You have to be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt. Believing is not enough. Now he had laid in the hospital for weeks, unable to speak. I think it's important that he was shot. He was hit before he could see anything. He sees Thomas Hankton in the doorway with a shotgun, but the ballistics examiner did not testify to any evidence of fire from a shotgun, only a nine millimeter. There's no evidence of a shotgun fired. The important point I wanna make here is that as he is shot, he explains why he believes that there's a second shooter, but he is unconscious or he is in shock. But I think you can rest assured that when he says, I believe that there's a second shooter, that is not enough to believe that. Strike that. Believe. To find beyond a reasonable doubt that there was a second shooter or to find beyond a reasonable doubt that Walter Porter was the second shooter. Curtis Matthews. This is the one case where we have, just going back to the John Matthews murder, I may be repeating myself, so I apologize. But it was Haley Smith that testified that Walter Porter told him that he followed John Matthews up the stairs to shoot him. That contradiction, again, is an insight into when they step out of their usual script of Walter Porter bragged about he used guns, that sort of thing. That's when we catch them in the lies. So the one eyewitness is Jimmy Madden. I have a picture from the video. I would like you to go back and look at that video very closely. We timed it. We believe it's less than two seconds that he actually saw the shooter. Listen to his statement very carefully. He was focused. Just stay on that. He was focused when he looked. This is as he is turning. When he looked, he said in his statement that he was focused on a black bandana on the assailant's face, and he also focused on a silver pistol. I think Miss Need did an excellent job demonstrating or bringing to your attention how easy it is to misidentify somebody. This was just a mirror. Please just stay there. Keep in mind that this was not the best circumstance. As you look at this, you can see shadows. You can see glare. There is darkness where the assailant is. You really can't identify somebody on those circumstances, especially when he is focused on a bandana and the silver pistol. He is focused on what he is doing at the time. He is not just sitting back waiting for a shooting to occur. He is focused on getting his bucket with his six beers and talking to his friends and getting back into the jazz party. This is just quick. Then he turns back and continues walking. I really encourage you to go back and watch this video. It's almost impossible to positively identify somebody under these circumstances and to be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt. So use your own personal experience in identifying 
when you maybe made a mistake by somebody that you knew and approached them under much better circumstances or a personal experience where somebody came up to you. It happened. I don't know if it's because my hair or something, but everybody thinks I remind them. People come up and go, oh, you're not so-and-so. I think it's also important that Jimmy Madden only saw one firearm, so he is not as focused as he would like you to believe or the government would like you to believe. Ballistics show there were two firearms. We believe, and this is up to you, based on the evidence that we see, we believe that the perpetrator was facing away from Jimmy Madden. The crime scene diagram shows that the casing shot off to the right, away from the perpetrator, who was facing the light. The perpetrator's body and face are angled towards the light, away from Jimmy Madden. Again, ladies and gentlemen, these are not ideal situations. Then he talked about what people on the streets know and, again, he gives us also an idea of the culture. He is not part of the same culture of the people, but there just seems to be this belief that everything is true, what you hear on the streets. They deal in rumors and accept that as the truth. We really don't know what he heard, what he did, and what influenced him. I think as jurors, you need to ask yourselves, how do you go from somebody who describes an assailant, but he's very clearly, and I ask you to listen to the tape statements, that he cannot identify the person. He says he can't identify the person. But then five days later, he says, well, I'm not from here, so I couldn't tell you his name. This guy is smarter than that. He knows that you don't have to know the name. Then when he comes and he testifies before you, he says that he has been here for two and a half years. So the story is not quite fitting, but I think what's the most important part is his opportunity to see the perpetrator. The other thing is he never identified Walter Porter in court. He never pointed him out. Then, as I have noted here, he was the one that called 911, waited at the scene for the police, accompanied the police to give a statement. These are all stuff, information that he is being as cooperative as he can be. I think when he said, I can't identify, he was telling the truth. Something happened in the five days. That, ladies and gentlemen, is reasonable doubt. I made a note here that detectives testified that they don't compose a lineup without a suspect. When Jimmy Madden is shown the lineup, he knows that there's somebody in there. He knows he needs to point somebody out. You have five minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, I think I've gone through what are the most important aspects of this case that show to you that the government has not proven their case on these multiple counts. Lots of mud against the wall that they call evidence. The only true verdict is not guilty. You can't believe these snitches. These horrible people that one of them said still loves Walter Porter. How much of a betrayal can you get when you say, I love somebody, but I want to get out of jail more, so I'm going to tell this story. Walter Porter, as the court will tell you and as you have heard, is presumed innocent. That presumption has not been removed, hasn't been overcome by the government. I've done the best I can to give you a very short synopsis of where I think the reasonable doubt is in this case, but it's your job, not my job. All I can do is help you. I've handed over to you the best I can with what I got, but it's entirely up to you. I leave it in your capable hands. Thank you for your attention.